What's up, guys? Hey, how you doing? Good to see you guys. So this episode, we're going to talk about the execution of the HVAC uh, after we spent a heavy amount of time doing the engineering. Yeah, so, this whole house is engineered, and I'm excited to see it. Yeah, right. let's go inside and check it out. Not a big house overall. It's a relatively small footprint. We maximize, you know, every square inch in here. We're in a tight mechanical room. I kind of want to walk through what we've installed. We worked with the plumber and did this multi-valve manifold to control the water feeds for all the fixtures in the house. That aside, the HVAC, we spent a heavy amount of time talking about all the equipment and what it's doing and why we chose it over, you know, maybe different makes or models is yeah. really important to understand and I'd love to kind of explain. Yeah, so I mean, I'll take you through the high level stuff. We have a condensing boiler here and the whole system is hydronically heated. A boiler that's uh, very efficient, it retains a lot of its latent energy. And what that means is that when this thing is running, the flue gas, where it actually goes up and out and leaves the building, is at a low enough temperature that we can actually get water droplets, condensation to form and to drip back down onto that heat exchanger. And so what that means is that we can get all that water vapor heat that would normally have lost, been lost outside. So really when you're talking about a low temp condensing boiler, you want it to condense, the condensing is a good thing, and all that drips down through the condensate neutralizer and then gets dumped to the drain. Gotcha, so one of the biggest complaints from a homeowner side is the, you know, I'm, I think I'm jumping ahead, but the, the delay in hot water. Yep. And how, you know, how are we combating that with, you know, in, in this sense? Because this is, this is producing hot water domestically, yep. but also for the heating system. So, yeah, to so speak that's all to done, the that's all done through the tank that Stefan put together, which is right over here. So you have your boiler feed in and out, which comes off the boiler, and then you have your domestic water, cold water in right here, and you got your hot water leaving right here. So you have a nice charged tank of water ready to go for any shower that calls, uh, and it goes out through a mixing valve so you're not gonna scald anybody. This really corrects the issue with the on-demand wa hot water, because you're storing hot water, but you're, you're making hot water on demand. Right, if this was a combi condensing boiler, that means it has to generate that heat and get it there in a quick amount of time. That's one of the downsides to the combi water heaters is that they don't deliver hot water that fast. Understood. With this system, you got the tank stored, ready to go, and then you can add a recirculation line that basically circs hot water on itself so you can get the water really quickly if you wanted to in this house. And, and Stefan, we've worked on other projects before where we've done the combi boiler and that was a big complaint. It's you wait a minute, a minute and a half. If, you're, if it's second or third floor bathroom, you can wait a really long time. Correct, yeah. So that's, a, that, that's kind of how we solved that one issue. I, I wanted to speak to the domestic side a little bit before we got into the heat because I think that's a question that comes up a lot. Sure. sure. But let's go back to the heat. So we mapped out all the zones. So as you come down here, you can work on them in the future and it's a problem. Each zone has its own individual pump. We set up two zones for future and then we have our last zone for our radiant. These two first zones go to two hydro coils, one for the basement and one for upstairs. All right, so let's take the viewers through what a hot water coil hydro air system is. So this pump is feeding hot water across the ceiling and coming down into this. Correct, right. yep. And it has an in and an out, so pretty much the hot water comes in. Fan inside here, it's kind of got a fan in a box. There's a hot water coil inside. The fan blows across the hot water coil and produces heat. In lieu of traditional furnace, gas-fired furnace, which there would be a flame inside this. That's right. Correct. And, you know, I think one thing that is spoken a lot is that type of heat tends to be really dry and the need for humidification. Sure. We're, we're not really drying out the air as much running hot water, a hot water coil versus the open flame, is that right. right? Right, think of a car radiator that's installed inside this unit with a fan. So there's no interaction between the air itself and the flame or anything combustion wise, right? It's just a water coil that gets warm. And then what's nice about it is because this one boiler is the only gas appliance that provides all of your heating, all of your hot water for this building. Now, what about from an efficiency standpoint? Because that's a question that comes up a lot in these designs is, is this more efficient? Is it the most efficient, you know? Yep. So a furnace efficiency and a boiler efficiency are gonna be relatively similar in that 90 to 95 range typically. Okay. So it's a, kind of a wash there. Um, I like the, the hydro air system with a hot water coil like this uh, for a bunch of reasons. One being the drying out of the air. Right. Uh, we have also less terminations on the building because each one of these, if it was a furnace, would have to be vented right, to the outside, so more terminations on the outside of the building. You know, in addition, uh, furnaces uh, are another gas safety device, so right. another fear of concern of a, you know, a gas issue. Yeah, especially when you have them installed on, say, living levels. Mm -hmm. Now you have an open flame, not necessarily an open flame, but there is a flame inside of a box, 
you know, and being in the mechanical room is one thing, and then when you start putting them in, you know, bedrooms or closets and things like that, right. you know, that does become a real concern of uh, the homeowner. That's right, that's right. So I think, you know, from all intents and purposes, I like this design a lot for these types of homes. Sure. Um, also, what's nice about this air handler is it provides air conditioning, right? right. So it's going to give us some dehumidification and it's going to give us cooling. And that's through these lines right here. So these go to condensers outside, but those condensers could be heat pumps, right? right? So this, is, this building or this unit is really future-proofed, where you could put a heat pump outside that would provide electricity-driven heating and cooling to this box. And you could basically take this offline or you could potentially use it as a hybrid approach. So you use this when it gets really cold out and you use the heat pump when it gets a little bit more mild. So the, the heat pump is typically used in like the shoulder season, spring and fall, right? It, so it depends on what kind of heat pump you choose. So there are cold climate heat pumps that operate to negative 13 degrees or below. Which would be more than sufficient for Massachusetts. Yeah, so in those applications, that handles all of the heating for your building. And so that would be connected to the line set here on the outside that would provide heating and cooling and through that would, this coil. Ultimately, we would be able to remove this with the exception of domestic hot domestic water. Domestic hot water would have to be solved some way. Yep. So that's that future-proof kind of mentality. Right, or you could provide a hybrid approach where you have a heat pump outside, either cold climate or regular, right? And you have this for the domestic hot water and also to carry the load at when it gets really cold out. So your heat pump outside carries most of the load for the heating of the, of the building. This kicks on when it really needs to, when it gets really cold out. Gotcha. So yeah, in, the, you know, in other projects, we have similar situations when we get into Radiant, which we're gonna talk about in a second, but Radiant, same thing. You know, There may be th that shoulder season where you need heat, but Radiant might be too much. Right, right. So before we go to Radiant, I wanna just mention a couple things here. Because Stefan's team had such a tight, confined space, what I loved, what they did here is they put in this plenum box. Gives you a place to bring your return air duct in, your mount your air handler on top of it, right? You got your condensate here, and you have this right here that allows you to easy access for your filter. So it slides out, right? It's your MERV 11, in this case, right? A MERV 11 filter? So you got a MERV 11 filter here, nice four inch pleated, you know, great unit. And so it, this box really kind of conserves space and gives you the best of both worlds. What I like about this is this puts everything in the mechanical room because often I've seen a lot where the you know, the return air has a filter maybe at the return grill. Right, right. Tough to access, nobody wants to look at it. Usually you only get it in one inch sizes. So here's Not only a nice... that, but it, it gets really dirty. It gets really dirty, yep, yep. So what's great about this is because you got that four inch high pleat, you get a high MERV rating with a low pressure job. So this fan doesn't have to work that hard to actually pull air across that, uh, that filter and then send it to the air, uh, into the supply air stream. And in addition, it's easy to access and easy to service. What does MERV stand for? So a MERV rating is a function of how much uh, filtration does that filter provide. And so being that, four inches thick has so, a higher rating? So MERV from one to 20. So once you get above 16, you're in that kind of HEPA filtration, which is high efficiency particulate air filtration. When you're below 16, you're in a regular MERV class. MERV 11 is a very good filter for residential usage. You could go as high as 20, but the sure. thing is the filters get really big and really restrictive. And probably really expensive. And get more, much more expensive, yeah. So a lot of times when you go to those crazy levels of filtration, you need a separate fan just to move the air across that filter. Gotcha. Right, and you need, and you need to change it a lot. So Stefan, we have this unit here. This is producing the, the heating and cooling for our first floor. Correct, yep. But we also have living space down here in the basement, but we're, we're heating and cooling this space. We're actually not cooling it, we're dehumidifying it. Mm -hmm. But how are we heating this space? Through a radiant manifold up above us. We kind of talked about, we have these two pumps for our air handlers. And then before we get into radiant, what, what's the point of having the, the two futures? What could, what could we add you know, that would require that pump? Um, if you wanted to put extra baseboard downstairs, um, I mean, it, it's kind of endless. Okay. Um, it's, Again, that future-proof mentality. Correct, yep. So then we have this one pump on the end. Does that indicate that we have one, uh, one zone of radiant? Um, no, we have two zones of radiant as of right now. So we did a one pump approach. It goes to a manifold that's a mixing station. So it allows us to take our 180 and bring it down to that you know, 90 degrees. And we pump it over to another manifold, which that manifold separates it to two zones by uh, taking the manifold and you take it into two power heads and allows you to divert the water to each area that you want to. So it opens and closes pretty much like a ball valve. It's pretty simple. It opens and closes and directs the water where depending on the thermostat is calling. So this hot water is, in, in, we mentioned two zones. We have the garage and then with, and, and this is how we're heating the basement. Correct. Right, so these two circuits right here and these two power heads serve the garage, right? So these are going to the garage slab 
these two power heads are serving the basement and that's coming off of this right here to feed the basement slab. But what are we doing with the, 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 other, the, the other pipes here? Th those are for extra. Extra. Right. So again, future-proof mentality. That's right. Um, but this works in a loop system, right? So that hot water is being produced and running through a loop and then returning back to be uh, heated up Right, again. so that mixing valve station that Stefan mentioned, this right here, has a pump and a mixing valve in it. So it delivers the right water temperature on the supply side to the radiant system. So, because the boiler could produce 180 degree water, we don't want 180 degrees to go to our radiant slab in our garage. Right. So this mixing valve and pump station basically allows us to dial it in to whatever temperature we want. It's on a reset curve, which means it changes with outside temperature. Uh, it's typically around like 90 degrees, you know, in that 80 to 100 range for this type of system. Which is important to note for a radiant, you know, it's more of mass heating. You're, you're not heating air and at a high temp and then trying to get it up to an ambient temperature. You're actually trying to make the room, you know, the mass of the room a very consistent temperature. So that, that delta between the room temperature and the water temperature is much closer than say for probably the hydro air. Right, and that's why these systems are so efficient, right? Because the radiant system only needs 90 degrees to heat the building. Right, where if you did a hydro, you might need 120. If you did another type of system like baseboard, or fin tube baseboard, you might need 180. Gotcha. Right? So, Stefan, we've talked about basement, first floor. What about second floor? Um, we have a whole complete system upstairs that's tied into the exact same system. So, we ran pipes all the way up, um, as well as Freon lines all the way up from outside to inside using the hydro approach. So, I assume that pump number two is going up to another air handler. Correct. And then we have another line set running up there. Correct. Why don't we head up there and see how that system is different from this one? Cool. We're up in the attic here, and what we're looking at is the air handler for, that feeds the second floor. This looks like the same unit. Correct, it is. They allow you to put it horizontal or vertical. We put this one right on its side, it's a lot easier. You don't have to stand it up approach, and it just allows you to kind of like dictate where you want to put ductwork so you allow it to have more storage up here for the homeowner. I think that's one thing that, Ross, we worked on early on is that the, the location and placement of ductwork. So we wanted to lay the ductwork out in a way that allows for storage up here but also lets us maximize the duct sizes that need to be served for this space. So downstairs we were looking at that second pump and we said that that's providing the heat to this unit. Yep. Walk me through where that where that's where that's coming in. Pipes right there, the copper pipes, that's the inlet and the outlet. So that's the supply and the return of the water that's going down to that mechanical room that we just saw. So that hot zone water. two pump feeds right here. So hot water is feeding up into here, Yep. doing the same same action as that unit down in the basement. Car radiator example is still here with off that hot water coil. And so that car radiator gets hot and there's a fan that basically blows air across that hot water coil and then basically distributes that air nice and hot to the room. Now, same thing with the air conditioning, same line set, same style condenser. Yep, you got your condensation uh, lines or, or refrigeration lines that are right here. These run along the ceiling here and then down and hit the condenser down outside. And so Stefan's guys did a great job. What I also like about this install is that we have a secondary drain pan. This is something that you don't often see. The secondary drain pan has a secondary overflow and a water safety switch. So in the event that this unit doesn't collect or do its job properly as far as disposal of condensate, it's gonna collect in this pan and this water sensor is gonna shut off the unit. So you're not gonna flood the area in the ceiling below. So that, that, that pan's gonna capture anything and then it shutting down the system so that water, that water flow is gonna stop as, as quickly as possible. That's right, yeah, so you have a primary pan that's connected right here and a secondary pan, right? So it's a nice, it's a nice safety touch that uh, Stefan and his guys did. I feel like this unit has a little bit more duct work than the one downstairs. Yeah, that's because of the ERV. So let's go take a look. So we talked about this in the last episode. I think it's super important to show and actually, why don't we take the, uh, to the viewers well, it's running. Yeah, that's okay. It's all right? That's all right. Okay. Yeah, it's got a safety switch. All right. So what I love about this unit is that it's an ERV. So it transfers both heat and moisture. Right? If it was an HRV, a heat recovery ventilator, it's gonna have a condensate pan. So we don't see a condensate pan here. There's no drain out the bottom of the unit. Um, so that's an energy Because that moisture ventilator. would get trapped and would need somewhere to go, this is actually pushing the moisture right through the unit. Transferring it. Transferring it. Right. So you have one air stream that comes through here, hits the filter, comes this way, hits the fan, and gets delivered to the space. And while it's happening, you've got exhaust, uh, sorry, uh, outside air that's coming this way, coming through the unit in this way, and going outside. Talk to me about what's going on in this cube. I know we've talked about it before on yep. previous episodes. What is really going on in here? Yeah, so this core is what's called a hydroscopic resin. It's a technical term that basically you think of it like cardboard. Okay. All right. And that there's corrugated. Two, it's corrugated cardboard that you think about. This. There's two passageways. There's this channel of passageways and this channel of passageways. Those passages don't come in contact with each other, meaning the air doesn't mix. It's in two separate straws, right? One straw is going this way and one bank of straws is going that way. 
And so what that allows is that those straws or that cardboard allows temperature and moisture exchange through the walls of that cardboard so that the contaminants don't pass through, but water vapor and heat can transfer through. So in the, so to speak to a winter month, if we have cold air coming in and you're, you're pulling the stale warm air out of the house, it's, it's crossing right. and that stale warm air is warming up the cold air. That's right. And then delivering it to the space. That's now right. it doesn't deliver that to the space directly. Is that right? Right. So in this case, what we've done is we've designed it in a way that the air coming off this core doesn't get dumped right into the house. It actually gets dumped into the return of the air handler we were just at. So Stefan, we talked about this before is that delivering it to the return. Well, what if the unit's not running? How does that air get delivered to the space? Well, the ductwork is tied to all the salins. So as the, the ductwork gets tied in, the ERV will pump air over to the return and actually picks up another air filter that allows it that to filter out one more time. And then as that machine kicks on, we actually condition the air that we're entering the home. One extra step that you can actually take. So the air is being delivered through the supply side of it when the unit is running. Right. But when that unit isn't running, how is that air getting to the space? It's dropping through the returns. So it's actually back feeding almost through the, through the return grills in the space. And if that temperature is a little bit lower, that's gonna trigger that thermostat and kick the unit on and then start tempering that air. That's right. So the, just to make a point though, this unit is do, really serving two purposes. It's giving us general ventilation of the building for ventilation air, right? To make, make sure we have good air, air quality inside, but it's also serving as the bathroom exhaust. So it really kills two birds with one stone. And that's, uh, that's a, I think for us, it's a great way to design it and it's a great way to see it executed in the field. How often does this unit run? All the time. All the time. Correct. And then how do we control, like, is there is there a controller for it? There is a controller downstairs. It's a percent timer. So you can control from 10% to 100%. Why don't we go look at that controller? I'd like to see that. So this is the, the controller right here. It looks like a regular light switch. Runtime percentage, we have it set at 100, but I see that there's a lot of options. Is there a reason that we set this at 100%? Right, so in this design, we've sized it for to run 100% of the time, all the time, because we need 100 CFM all the time. So the ERV size for 100 CFM. So and that's the way it's designed, but what about energy consumption for that, that motor running continuously? So that unit runs at about 40 watts, so it's like leaving a 40 watt light bulb on. But the thing is, because it's running all the time, you're getting fresh, air into your house all the time. So you're not gonna have stale air when you walk in here and you can really, you can sense a difference, right? You can feel the difference in this house. Right, yeah, and, and that's, I mean, especially, you know, the saying, you know, build build tight, ventilate right. Yep. This house was built extremely tight. We, we talked about that on a previous episode is the way we've de designed the envelope and having the, the air kind of stuck in here would be really uncomfortable. Right, and we could have designed it a little differently too. We could have done a, a larger unit and we could run it at low speed, high speed. So we could have a low speed continuous operation and then we could have a boost capability for even higher amounts of ventilation if we wanted to. So sure. th those options exist, slightly different control panel, but the same idea. Now, real quickly, we're, we're taking the stale air out of the bathrooms at a continuous rate. Mm -hmm. This is replacing the traditional bathroom fan that you walk in and you turn on? Right, so we don't have the ceiling fan like you typically would see in a bathroom in this, in this house. What's great about that is that the architecture detail looking, you have a register, not the fan, you don't have any sound, right? So the ERV, because it kills two, two birds with one stone, we don't have any sound, we don't have any of that stuff to worry about. But in, you know, in certain circumstances, we do have to run a booster fan for bathrooms if we get into, say, additional steam or really hot showers and things like that. That's right, so you have to be careful about what kind of bathroom you have, right? So if you have a steam shower or something like that or a lot of moisture capability, then yeah, you're gonna wanna have a boost fan, an additional inline or ceiling fan. So we really designed the house to not need the, the additional bathroom fans. That's right, in this house, we don't need the additional boost, but if we needed it, we could add it. So the, the last thing we haven't talked about is we're talking about ventilation here for the whole house, but for the kitchen ventilation. That's right. So why don't we hop down in the kitchen and touch on that real quick. Before we talk about the makeup air, I just wanted to mention and call out the millwork team and Stefan's team did a great job to get the return air built into the toe kick here of the millwork. I totally forgot about that. I remember when they were installing this, these cabinets, there was a big hole in the floor and everyone kept asking, what are we gonna do with that? It's a challenge, right? Because kitchens have very limited space for supply and return grills. And so to get return air from a kitchen like this is very challenging. So if we can detail it into a space like this, so it literally is invisible to the, you know, to the eye and use it down there and get it 10 feet away from a cooktop, I mean, it's a great way to do it. Well, two, two points to that, One, you know, as far as the detail, we have that recessed toe kick with that kind of furniture base in front of it. And the air is actually going in and that toe kick traditionally is four inches tall. We actually did the math and figured out how many cubic inches we needed of space. And we dropped that toe kick down to three inches. So when you're standing at, you know, 
say five, six feet tall, you can't see that gap. The air right. is going in and over and above. Completely invisible. And Ross, I don't know if you knew this, but we actually did the same for underneath the sink in the range, and that's actually our supply. Nice. So we built these ductwork kind of plenum style and did the supply dumping out there as well so we could get it as close to you know our window wall. It's a great detail. A question that we got um, a few times though, and we went back and forth talking about it, is can the return be in the kitchen? So the return can be in the kitchen, but it really needs to be away from the cooking surfaces, right? So it depends on which code has been adopted in the state that you're in. Sure. But in general, we typically like to recommend at least 10 feet away from the cooking surface. Because the idea is that we don't want to get any gas combustion from the cooktop to get it sucked into the return and then redistribute it to the rest of the house. Right. It also works to our advantage that this is an open floor plan, right? Because we're trying to, we're pulling air across the entire space, not just in this kind of closed off kitchen. Right, it's an open concept, right? Right. So where do you define your kitchen? Where do you define your living room? All of that, there are no walls. Sure. Right, that separate the spaces. So this return is serving this open floor plan right here. Yeah, this was a really good detail and something we adopted on a few of our projects now. Yeah. So kitchen exhaust, future episode, we're gonna talk about this in depth. I know there's a lot of uh, concern with whether or not this makeup air detail works. Right. You bought, what'd you buy? Smoke bombs. Smoke bombs. Yep. So we're and gonna smoke set, grenades. Smoke grenades. Um, we tested one outside, and oddly puts enough, out a lot of smoke. the fire yeah. department showed up immediately <laughs> for something else, but not. But it was just it was ironic. Don't do this at home. <laughs> but we're we're gonna we're gonna put this to the test because there's an interesting way that we're we're adapting our makeup air as well as our kitchen exhaust mm -hmm. within this hood. So stay tuned for a future episode. Uh, big thank you to Ross and Stefan. You guys did a killer job. Uh, really happy with how this, this house came out uh, and the way, you know, really the comfortability. And that goes back to our uh, the original episode is that this isn't about temperature, it's about comfortability. Good design, good execution, you know, all around. So great job. As always guys, we appreciate you watching. Make sure you follow along on Instagram at NSBuilders. Ross Trithui at TE2 Engineering. Uh, Stefan Tuzzi at Stefan at East Coast Comfort. Make sure you subscribe and turn on those notifications. See you guys next time. Thanks.